What's your favorite distraction? We all have distractions in life, and we all have the distractions we choose. And what's your favorite? Unfortunately, today, we're in a world that is filled with distractions. Distractions that make it hard to focus. Distractions that make it hard to concentrate on something. You go to schools, and one of the issues they have today in schools are teens and kids on their cell phones. You go to work, and one of the issues they have in jobs is people on their phones. You go to church, and one of the problems we have is people on Facebook or phones, right? Not for the Bible, but for other reasons. What's your favorite distraction? How often do you find yourself distracted? In our day, it's easy to become distracted with everything going on around us. Often, I know I will set out to do a task to accomplish something, and I get distracted by one thing or another. I know often I'll be sitting at home and I'll be working on something, and then all of a sudden I think, you know what, I need to reach out to this person so I use the Facebook Messenger app. Well, what happens when you go into Facebook? You see all this fake news that distracts you, right? We get distracted. For you, it may not be Facebook that distracts you. It may be YouTube videos. It may be Snapchat. It may be fill in the blank of whatever it is. But what is a distraction in your life? You see, we are called as Christians to live a focused life, but it is hard to do so today because of the distractions, especially with social media. Back when I was growing up, the, distract, the, the distraction was the preoccupation with all the horrible news going on on the news channels, right? Because we would get so in tune with what's going on around the world because we now have access through television media for everything going around the world that we lost sight of what's actually going on in our own lives. And the fear was, parents don't sit your children in front of the TV for too long. It'll warp their brain, and they'll be antisocial. And somehow, my generation survived it. And today, the fear is, parents don't let your kids be on their iPads or their cell phones or fill in the blank too long. Because it'll warp their brains and it'll ruin their lives and they'll become antisocial. And somehow they'll probably survive as well. But in reality what it was is those things can be a distraction from what's really going on to the point that we don't even notice our surroundings. Go into any restaurant. Most of us are probably going to go to a restaurant after church. Walk into the restaurant and do this. Look around and see how many people are on a cell phone. They have people sitting right there with them, but what you see the whole table doing is this. I love a photo whenever I lived in Virginia that uh, Chris took in our house. And it was me and Chris and Bill and Katie. I don't remember who all it was, but we were all sitting around the table in the dining room, and each one of us was on our poison. Either a cell phone or an iPad or a computer. We were all on something. And we were in the same room searching that device. Why? Because it was a distraction. What is your distraction? You see, distractions can be okay and they can be fun at times, but they can also complicate life and they can cause harm in our day-to-day -day lives. Checking in on each other is something that we do often, whether it's through a social media or some other distraction, and we get so consumed with Facebook and what's going on, or, or we get so consumed with Instagram or Snapchat or whatever it is that we lose track of what's going on in real time, and we're only looking in on each other. You see, the problem is our distraction also can often become our addiction. Our distraction can become our addiction, meaning that we struggle to let go of the distraction because we want to be so in tune to what's going on with everybody else that we don't live our own life. You see, if you can't put your phone down, you have a distraction problem. If you can't get off Facebook for one hour on a Sunday morning or Snapchat or whatever you crazy kids are using these days, you have a problem. It is becoming such a prevalent problem that even in the psychology world, they are creating an addiction issue. 
they're providing training on how you treat this stuff. Because we become addicted to our distractions. Checking in on each other has become such a problem that many companies have begun to place site blockers on social media sites to keep their employees on task, leading to more productivity and focus in their company. Isn't that sad that we don't have the self-control so the company is doing that for us and often in more and more cases? But this is not only a problem for corporate America, it's a problem for us as well. We can get so caught up into paying attention to what everyone else is doing that we neglect to focus on the work at hand and we neglect ultimately to focus on the work God has given us as Christians. We become so caught up in the lies and the quarrels and the drama of others that we pour gasoline on the fire rather than become peacemakers on the earth. I've had several Facebook groups that I'm, I've been a part of over the years. And everyone younger than me is making fun that I'm still on Facebook, I'm sure, right now. But that's okay. I've had to let those groups go. Because it becomes drama filled. I live in an um, area that we have an HOA. And I have my own opinions about HOA associations, but... They have a Facebook page that has become so drama-filled, I told Katie, just tell me what's important, and otherwise I'm dropping out of this page. There's Church of Christ groups that are so filled with drama because everybody's quarreling and they're up in everybody else's business and they're keeping the sheep that don't even belong to them, that it becomes so quarrelsome and drama-filled that it becomes a distraction that we don't need in our lives. So I dropped out of those Facebook groups. Why? Because they're just a distraction keeping me from doing the task I've been given. The task God has given, not just to me, but to all of us. And this is nothing new, although Facebook is relatively new and social media and its problems are relatively recent. The same issue existed long ago. The social media problem existed in the time of Paul. Turn with me to the book of First Thess- Thessalonians. I'll get it out. Chapter 4. And we're going to see this problem being addressed this morning. You see, Paul is looking at the church and he's telling them, stop being distracted, but be focused. Now we're going to go over the first half of this chapter tonight. So please come back at 6 o'clock as we go over that. But This morning, we're going to go over the distraction and the desire for the Christian to be focused. Now, let's look in verse 9 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write you. Isn't that great? Wouldn't that be awesome if the Apostle Paul was around today and he wrote the Lakewood Church of Christ and said, I don't have to tell you anything about brotherly love because you you guys are the shining model." For what it means to love one another. He says in verse 9, For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. Now, he is commending them on their love, but he's about to explain what does it mean to love one another. And I'm going to argue that what he says it means to love one another is to focus on the right things and not be distracted by the wrong things. Because when we become distracted by the wrong things, what does that produce? As we've said, it produces Whirling, it produces nosiness and all these other issues that come into play. So as we read this, he's going to talk about the idea, you are a model of love, and here's how you love. By having a focus on what God has given you, rather than distraction that you're focusing on. So he says, you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, for that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. Now we've talked about this as we've been studying through First Thessalonians on Wednesdays and Sundays. We've talked about this idea that they're going out and not just in Thessalonica, but throughout the whole region. They're sharing the gospel with others. They're loving others and they're bringing others to Christ. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. Keep on going. 
and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. So when he talks about this idea of what does it mean to live a focused life and why we do it, it's because of how we're perceived by outsiders so that we walk correctly among them. It also is because of how we're perceived by God, isn't it? As Christians, we have all these distractions in our lives, but we have to live a focused life because we're here for a purpose on mission. And it's not to be distracted with the world and worldly things and worldly ways, but it's to be on the mission of God so that we're focused on the eternal things, not on the world. And as we walk through this text, I want to look at what is it that a focused life includes. Now, let me put a disclaimer. I'm going to step on toes this morning. But you know what the good news is? It's not me stepping on them, it's the Word of God. And whenever our toes are stepped on by the Word of God, that is good news because we now know what it is we need to adjust in our life to become more God. When God steps on our toes, it is not to hurt us or cause us shame, it is to encourage us and improve us in our godly walk so that we improve our focus and our example in this world. And so as we look through this text, one of the first things that we see a focused life includes is living a quiet life in verse 11. Living a quiet life. A focused life means to live quietly. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 6 talks about this. Better is a handful of quietness than two handfuls of toil and striving after wind. In Proverbs 17, verse 1, better is a dry morsel with quiet than a home full of feasting with strife. The point of these verses as Christians is that we demonstrate love by living a quiet life that does not produce demands and strife among the church or its community. Now, when we talk about the word quiet today, we mean something different than what the Greek text is meaning in this. This doesn't mean we can never say anything. It doesn't mean we can't communicate with others. We don't walk around as a monk who took a vow of silence. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the way in which you live your life. We get a little hint into this in a few more verses. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, it says that Christians should pray for kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Did you catch that? Pray for all these leaders. Pray for them who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life. It's not just that we don't go around saying things. It's that we are peaceful, but by peaceful, it means what? That we are godly and dignified in every way. Church, how are we doing at that? The ancient Christians are reminded to live a life perceived as being dignified and quiet. In other words, holy, as God is holy. The word quiet in our language refers to sound. However, when the Greek is investigated, we find a much broader term range. The meaning when we look at this is that we are to have a life that is not going around causing problems where there are no problems. It means that we're going around and we're having a life that does not stir up trouble and strife but rather we are peaceful, we are calm, we are dignified. We are perceived as people who are holy and made holy by God. If you have not picked up on the idea of quietness, it is the idea of living a life that does not stir up trouble among others. The church in Thessalonica was already under persecution, and the last thing Paul wanted them to do was cause more problems through disturbance in the way that they lived and interacted with others. And this is even more difficult today in our quick pace, little thought given to anything world that we live in. Right? 
when people look at you and your life, do they say they live a quiet life? That doesn't mean we take our personality out of it. If you're a talker, you can talk. But do they look at you and say they live a peaceful, dignified life? Or do they look at you saying, man, they stir up trouble wherever they go? How are you doing at living a quiet life? Not just in the eyes of God, but in the eyes of the world. Because if we live a focused life, the first thing is that it will be a quiet, dignified life. But secondly, in verse 11, we see that it's a life in which you mind your own business. A focused life means minding your own business business. Did we catch that? Here, let's all say it together. Mind your own business. Amen, Jonathan. You ever met someone that can't mind their own business? They stick their nose into everything. And this is not saying we don't check up and we don't love on each other and we don't encourage each other. That's not what we're getting at. It means that you don't put yourself and insert yourself into everybody else's business, whether it's Uh, other person or another congregation. How many people you know come up and go, hey, hey, did you hear about such and such congregation and what they're doing, what they're not doing, or what they started doing, or what they're thinking about doing, or what they did start doing, did doing? Who cares? I love, I love the brothers and sisters who seem to think their job in Christ is to be the watchdog of churches they have no part of. I love them because I I know they think they're doing right. But they struggle to understand part of walking a focused life is not in their own business. Are there rumors out there about what other churches are doing? Yeah, but let me ask you something you attend that church? If the answer is no, why does it matter? Right? What I love about the Church of Christ is we're autonomous. What I hate about the Church of Christ is we're only autonomous until we don't until we want to gossip about another church. Mind your own affairs. You see, we get so caught up in minding the affairs of others, we don't mind our own. We don't take care of our own. And we're running around, and gossip's not the only way we do this, but we run around and we're minding the affairs of others that we neglect our own affairs. And that ruins our own life, and it ruins our own house, whether that's church, whether that's our physical home that we live in with our family, in other words, or whether that's our own spiritual soul. Church, I'm not saying it. It's the Apostle Paul. If you want to get mad at someone, get mad at the Apostle Paul. But he says, mind your own business. I love how the NIV translates it. Instead of affairs, they say, you should mind your own business. Christians are not called to be sticking their nose in every other individual's business. We are called to be those not who run around sharing what's going on with everyone else's life. And the church down the road, or that one state, not allowing that one thing to take place in that one way. Rather, we are called to attend to our own affairs. Imagine how much more work would be accomplished if we focused on the work done at Lakewood, the work done in our lives individually and collectively, rather than the work done in other lives. Proverbs 26, verse 17 says, a person who is passing, I love this, A person who is passing by and meddles in a quarrel that is not his is like one who grabs a wild dog by the ears. That's not a good idea, by the way. If you've never grabbed a dog by the ears that doesn't know you, they get mad. And what happens? They bite you. A person who is passing by and meddles in a quarrel that is not theirs. You guys ever known someone who kind of lurks around because they want to hear what you're saying? And what's funny is they can just be within earshot, but you can kind of sense the presence of the lurker. Mm -hmm. 
Guys, don't be lurkers. Not only is it creepy, it's ungodly. <laughs> it, just, it is creepy, isn't it? I, never mind, I've got a story about lurking that Mark Hickson told me the other day. But, um, guys, here's the thing. Whose business are we involved in? Now, it's different if somebody invites you in to their situation and asks for your help. And it's different to, un- to know that there's a need and to offer the help. But what we're talking about is the idea of nosiness. Does that make sense? The difference? We're talking about the idea of the uninvited shoving your nose in where it doesn't belong or the uninvited critiquing and commenting on something you don't understand. Guys, I do this sometimes. I understand that just like you do this sometimes. We all struggle with it. But if we focus on the work of God He has given us to do, on the affairs that we have to handle, I can guarantee you won't have time to focus on the affairs of others. I've had people throughout my short tenure here on earth that have come up to me over the years saying, hey, did you hear about this church? Or hey, that this church, man, they're not saved anymore because they're doing such and such. Or have you heard what they're doing? Or did you hear about this big change, such and such church? And you know what I really want to say? Now, I try to be a little bit nicer than this, but I really want to say, who cares? I don't have time to worry about them. Because I've got enough sheep in my care. I've got enough ministry to do here. Church, as Christians, we're called to be minding the business God has given us. I I, I want to quote a few more verses and a few more quotes here. Uh, one author says, One who tends to his own affairs does not meddle in the business of others, for they have no time to do so. First, Timothy chapter 5, verses 11 through 14, talking about young widows. Now, I'm not saying anything bad about young widows, but it does make a point about this idea. He says, at the same time, these young widows also learn how to be lazy while going from house to house. Not only this, but they become they even become gossips and keep busy by what? Interfering in other people's lives. In other words, some translations say they become busybodies saying things they should not say. It's not just young widows who do that, by the way. Don't be a busybody. That'd be kind of a fun sermon title. Don't be a busybody. Be yourself. Don't misunderstand as Christians. We are to encourage others. We are to help others out. We are to look after the benefit of another But there's a difference in looking out for someone and getting into something that you have no right to be involved in. There's a difference in saying so-and-so needs some help versus saying, hey, did you hear about such and such? And you're just passing on third, fourth, fifth, sixteenth hand knowledge in the situation. A focus line is minding our own business. Because church, let me tell you, God gave us enough business that it will occupy our life. And this leads into the idea of getting to work. A focused life means getting to work. You see, when we mind our own business, we can then get to work with what God has given us to be doing. If we start by minding our own business, you see, now we understand God has given me a task. He has given me business. So now I can get to work in that. What was the problem with the young widows? It was that they were lazy. They weren't doing the work God had called. But as was said, it it was that they became lazy and become busybodies. And they used all of their energy to be in everybody else's business instead of doing what God had tasked them to do. Get to work. The person who works to provide for his or her own needs, one author writes, and the needs of his family does not put a burden on others to support him or her. Greek culture degraded manual labor, but Christianity with Judaism also view 
it as an honorable pursuit. Now, this is talking about the idea of physical labor, and there is something to be said within this text, as well as many other texts, that we have to work. God called us to work. What happened in the garden? God made man. He made Adam and Eve. And what was the job? Tend to God's creation. And what? If you tend to God's creation, if you tend to the task that God gave you, if you get to work, find that you're too busy to be caught up in all these other things, these other distractions that happen. You find that you're more focused on the task at hand. Church, we need to have blinders on us. If you don't know what I'm talking about, if you've seen those shows where a horse is pulling a carriage, they put blinders often on the horse so that he doesn't see the carriage in his peripheral vision and spook. Rather, they put on blinders so that he has tunnel vision and he focuses on the task at We get focused on the task. Because when we don't, bad things happen. I remember uh, when we were growing up in New Mexico, I don't know if my sister remembers this or not, but I, I remember my grandfather had this old kind of cart with two wheels, and you'd sit on it, and you hooked it up to a horse and his harness. And I remember one time, this is a famous saying in my family of, oh, we'll be fine. Well, do we need to put on blinders? No, we'll be fine. Do we need to tie that down in the trunk? Oh, it'll be fine. We're only going a little way. And this was another one of those instances where we didn't put blinders on the horse. And we were doing okay for a few moments until we made a slight turn. The horse got spooked by the cart that he saw coming towards him. And he just went nuts, flipped the cart. Why? Because when you don't have tunnel vision to what God has called you to do, you can't do the work he's called you. Because you're distracted by everything else around you. Church, let's get to work doing what Christ has called us to do. The encouragement to get to work stands in contrast to those who are busybodies. This is echoed in Paul's second letter to the church in Thessalonica when he writes in chapter 3, verse 11, We hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. The concept here, the main point, here is that one should be working, not meddling. Get to work. Proverbs 14, verse 23 says, In all toil there is profit, but men, but mere talk tends only to poverty. What happens when all we do is get distracted? We fall to ruin. Church, The point is that Christians need to be busy working, not meddling. We need to be about the Father's business, not the business of others. We need to be about the Great Commission, not about what every other congregation or person is doing. As we get to work, we will be demonstrating love to others and to God, and it will bring glory to the Father in Heaven, and it will demonstrate a focused life that follows Christ. A focused life that does great things in the name of God and for His glory. By living a peaceful, quiet life and doing the work of God rather than poking our nose in the business that it does not belong in, I believe Scripture teaches that God will accomplish great things through us. What God has placed in front of you is the task we are to be focused on. But here's my question this morning. What great work, what great thing, what great task or business has God placed in front of you this week? That you've been too distracted to focus on. What task has God given you that you have been so distracted you have neglected working on? You've let every other thing, and sometimes it's good things. But there's still distractions. What work has God given you that you need to focus on? Will you rise to the challenge or will you allow other things to distract you from seeing what God could accomplish in your life and in the life of this congregation? 
Father, we ask that you change our hearts, that you encourage us to rise to the challenge of being busy with kingdom work, not meddling in the lives of others. Help us to pay no attention to gossip and contribute nothing to strife. Rather, instill a passion in our spirit to spread the gospel, to love our neighbors, and to ultimately glorify you. God, we know that the work is great. We know that the harvest is plentiful, but we need your help to accomplish this work. Although the task seems daunting, we ask you to continually remind us of your presence, your power, and to give us courage to attempt great things in your name for your glory. In the name of Jesus.